Welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 4 section of the abdomen, our Lecture 7 on the kidney, adrenal glands, and spleen. So the first organ we're going to discuss are the kidneys. So the kidneys are bilaterally located organs that are important for a number of different functions. They're important for overall filtration of the blood as they receive about one-fourth the cardiac output from the heart. And that helps with just overall perfusion of the kidneys as well as a number of different other functions. The kidneys also help with the production of red blood cells. They secrete a substance called erythropoietin, or EPO, from the peritubular capillaries. EPO then goes to the bone marrow and helps with stimulation of RBC production. The kidneys also help with efficient electrolyte management. Depending if the body is in deficit or in excess of a certain electrolytes, the kidneys will either excrete or reabsorb them. And finally, the kidneys also help with blood pressure regulation. They do this by the RAS system, or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So based on one, the concentration of sodium, and two, the amount of blood entering into the kidneys, the kidneys will then secrete renin. Renin then helps with the conversion and may production of angiotensin one, which then goes to the lungs to make angiotensin two, which then goes to the adrenal glands to make aldosterone. Aldosterone then goes back to the kidneys and helps with blood pressure regulation. So these kidneys are these bean-shaped organs that are located in the retroperitoneal space and they're located in intimate with the inferior ribs, which often puts them at risk for puncturing and injury with inferior rib fractures, such as in a motor vehicle accident. So the kidneys, as we discussed, are located in the inferior portion of the ribs but also because of the liver on the right upper quadrant, it pushes the right kidney to be a little further down than the left kidney. What's also important to talk about is the embryogenesis of the kidneys. So the kidneys are separate organs, however in certain instances they may actually fuse. So the kidneys arise in the lower abdominal cavity or the pelvic cavity and they are attached to the abdominal aorta. As the fetus starts to grow and the abdominal aorta starts to elongate, it naturally will carry up the kidneys. However, if for some reason these kidneys are fused and for any reason, they will actually get caught on the inferior mesenteric artery and fail to ascend, and then they'll be called horseshoe kidneys. Physiologically, they're normal and have no really overall problems. However, in certain instances, they may cause a problem. They may be an incidental finding on a CT scan, or because their ureter will not come from a normal location like this renal hilum, the ureter may actually have an increased risk of uh, ureteric obstructions, as well as if someone were to operate in this area of the body and not expect to see a fused kidney, you could have some sort of iatrogenic injury as well. So as we discussed, the kidneys, although they are retroperitoneal, they are also in very close contact with certain structures. Anteriorly, they're close to the liver, they're close to the spleen, they're close to the duodenum, stomach, the colon, pancreas, jejunum, as well as the adrenal glands. And the posterior aspect is also, of course, has the adrenal glands as well as the diaphragm. The quadratus lumborum is in close contact, the psoas major, and the anterior abdominal wall musculature. So all this pretty much means is the kidneys, although, are, although they are protected, they are in, still in close contact with a lot of other organs and structures that when they become inflamed or irritated, it can sometimes even cause some sort of compression and back pain just because of the fact they are in such close proximity. So as we discussed before, with the liver being in the right upper quadrant, the left kidney gets to be a little bit lower around T12 to L3, while the right kidney is kind of located in more of the L1 to L4 region. And of course, this is often tested, and I'm not exactly sure why, but the structures surrounding the kidneys. They're composed of, of course, the renal capsule, then the perirenal fat, the renal fascia, and the pararenal fat. And these structures overall just supply a sort of protection for the kidney. Other than that, there's pretty much no other purpose besides for just protection. It's also important to talk about the renal hilum, just like the hilum of the lungs. It's the structures in the medial aspect of the organs where all the important structures enter into, being the renal arteries, renal veins, the ureters, any sort of renal lymphatics. And I guess you could also include the nervous structures, the autonomic nerves as well that help with the regulation of the kidneys. So now we'll discuss the kidney's anatomical structure. So much like all the other organs in the body, the kidneys are composed of a parenchyma and a stroma. The parenchyma is the functional unit of the kidney, 
where the stroma is considered to be like the scaffold or the supportive network that keeps the parenchyma in place. The parenchyma of the kidneys is composed of the inner medulla and the outer cortex. The inner medulla, the way I think of it is almost M for middle, is the middle area of the kidneys, where the cortex, like C, if you imagine like the C kind of hugging the kidney, is the outside. Same goes for a lymph node. You have a cortex and a medulla in the lymph node as well. So the inner medulla is where you have the deep descending straight segments of the nephron, a loop of Henle, as well as the collecting duct system where it enters into the minor and major calyces right before it enters into the ureter. The outer cortex is what houses the glomerulus and the proximal segments of the nephron, including the PCT and the DCT. It's also important to talk about how like any other structure, the further you are away from an oxygenated system, the more likely you are for ischemic injury. So as blood enters into the kidney, and then we're going to wrap around and come through this way. So the medulla oftentimes receives oxygen-poor blood and can even be susceptible to ischemic injury. So now we're going to discuss the functional units of the kidney. So as we discuss the functional units of the kidney, it's important to quickly make note that physiology is highly tied in. However, for the purpose of this, and for how complex physiology is, we're only going to discuss physiological highlights. So, as blood enters into the renal vasculature, it will then enter a structure called the glomerulus, which is a dilated portion of the renal vasculature. And that is where you have a very selective filter composing of a very fine basement membrane and specific podocytes that allow for certain substances to pass through. These substances that pass through will then ultimately become the ultrafiltrate. Every substance that doesn't pass through will then carry on through the renal vasculature and then get circulated throughout the body. Those are things like red blood cells, which are too large, as well as certain large proteins like albumin. These should not get filtered through, and if they do, it's usually pathologic. So the ultrafiltrate is where you have your metabolic wastes, your glucose, you have your urea, your creatinine. You have all this stuff that your body kind of has to figure out, what are we going to do with it? So as you get to the next section, after the glomerulus, you have the functional unit of the kidney called the nephron. The nephron is composed of many different pivotal tubular segments. The first one is called the PCT, or the proximal convoluted tubule. And this is where almost everything that was just passed through the glomerulus has to be reabsorbed. This is where majority of reabsorption happens, because you've got to keep the body in a state of homeostatic balance, and you've got to pretty much reabsorb everything in the PCT. Everything after the PCT is just really used for fine tuning. So this is where substances like glucose, bicarb, protein, electrolytes, and of course water get reabsorbed. The next section is you have your proximal straight tubule, and this is pretty much a site of water reabsorption. The next section, you have your loop of Henle, which is the very bottom part right here. And this is where your loop diuretics or your substances like furosemide, these substances will actually affect on the loop more often than the distal straight, but and nonetheless, the loop of Henle here, and it affects this to allow for proper secretion of water. The next section you have is the distal straight tubule, and this is where further reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride for through a transporter that controls all three of these together happens, is where it's paracellular. So paracellular means they pass through, not necessarily through the cell, but they pass through between the cells. And that's where calcium and magnesium happens. So sodium, potassium, chloride pass through a specific channel on each of these tubular cells, but magnesium and calcium actually pass through paracellularly. What's really going on here is that these tubules are making a concentration difference in solutes outside the kidneys as opposed to in the tubules that drives the movement of water. Secretion of urea in this space is one of the main solutes that actually allows for movement and manipulation of the water content. And that's pretty much how the kidneys work. They build this whole area up around here to have a really fine and really integral solute concentration. And this solute concentration will then eventually drive the movement of water. And that is how the kidney kind of helps control water balance and solute balance. And if this is disrupted for any reason, such as diuretics or certain ischemic processes, you will have pathologic presentations such as edema presentation or electrolyte abnormalities. The last section is the distal convoluted tubule and this is where we primarily resorb sodium and chloride and this is where you have 
diuretics like thiazides work. So now we'll discuss the pair tube of the capillaries. So these are blood vessels, little capillaries that actually wrap around and surround the tubular structures of the nephron. And this is where you can actually get reabsorption of certain electrolytes into the vasculature, as well as further secretion of substances like creatinine into the renal tubules. And it's also, besides being a almost like a passageway of nutrients in and out of the vasculature after the glomerulus, it's also important because it's these peritubic capillaries that produce EPO, which helps with production of RBCs. And as we discussed before, you have the juxtaglomerular complex, which is the onset of the RAS system, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. It's a small unit of cells that are located in the vascular wall next to the glomerulus. And as we said before, it monitors the concentration of the, of the blood via looking at the sodium, as well as it also monitors the amount of blood flow, the amount of blood passing through. So based on the amount of blood and based on the amount of sodium, these two reasons will actually drive the JG complex to produce the renin. The renin, like I said before, helps with secretion of angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs, makes angiotensin 2, which then goes to the adrenal glands to make aldosterone, that then goes back to the collecting tubule of the kidneys and helps with management of blood pressure and water balance. And finally, the collecting tubules, the collecting duct system, as we mentioned before, this is the very terminal segment. And this is where you have fine tuning the really last alterations in water balance that happen. This is what eventually makes up the final concentration of the urine. So if you're really thirsty, it's this segment right here that'll make your urine concentrated. If you are in the middle of a fresh pool and you're drinking a lot of fresh water and you, your urine's really dilute, it's all because the collecting duct system is failing to reabsorb the water because it doesn't need to. So the collecting tubule the collecting duct system is important because it absorbs things like sodium, protons, water, all via ADH and aquaporins and regulated by aldosterone, ADH also called vasopressin. So the collecting duct system is continuous with the DCT as well as the minor calyces which drain to the major, the renal pelvis, and then finally the ureters which go to the bladder. So now we'll discuss the blood flow into the kidneys briefly. So the kidneys utilize a significant amount of blood and they require up to about one fourth of the blood coming from the cardiac output. And they need to do this because they need to help with very efficient and effective blood pressure management. So the structures, arterial to venous structures that receive blood, follow in this pattern. You get the renal artery, which comes off of the abdominal aorta, then follows with the segmental artery. Then you get your interlobular artery, which passes through. You get your arcuate artery that all follows almost above the arch. Your interlobular, which passes right through here. And then you have it where it's tiny and almost it's invisible on the gross eye is you have your afferent vessels which then pass into the glomerulus themselves. So once the blood vessel passes through the glomerulus it then becomes an efferent vessel, an efferent arterial, and then passes through, wraps around the tubular system as a pair of tubular capillaries, then becomes an interlobular vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, and then eventually a renal vein. Again, this is one of those systems that's kind of important to kind of memorize because it's often tested for no apparent reason, just, just to see if you remember it. But just remember the hallmarks. Renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar to arcuate to interlobular. So all this right here pretty much is the same in the venous end of it. Then you got your afferent to the efferent. You got your unique peritubular capillaries. And then, like we said before, interlobular, arcuate, interlobar veins. So these three, pretty much the same as these three. This is pretty easy. Afferent in, glomerulus, efferent out, your unique peritubular capillaries. You got these three again, and then your renal veins. So even though the kidneys are in the abdominal cavity, retroperitoneal structures, they drain to the IVC. They do not have any association with the portal venous system. So the kidneys themselves, the kidney has a longer renal vein, and the right renal vein is shorter. The long renal vein actually gets the left gonadal vein, enters at a 90 degree angle. What's also important to note is again that you're going to get thrombosis here, and it can also predispose you to varicoceles in a male, 
But also, if someone has a transplant, a kidney transplant that's required, they often try to harvest the left kidney based on the length of the renal vein, which is based on the fact that there's just more slack when you try to do a reanastomosis recoaptation than the transplanted recipient. So now we'll discuss the sensory innervation to the kidneys real quick. So just like every other organ in the body, you got your autonomics. So you got your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. Your sympathetic helps with vasoconstriction of the renal blood vessels, and your parasympathetic helps with the vagus nerve and the vasodilatory functions. Your parasympathetics for your kidneys come from your vagus nerve, which comes off of the brainstem itself. And your sympathetic nervous systems come off the trunk of the spinal cord at the intermediate horn. They travel through associated sympathetic trunks and come off into the kidneys. What's also important to discuss besides this autonomics is the sensory input. So the sensory input to the kidneys, the fact that they have, as we discussed before, they have a renal capsule, they can also be injured, affected, or irritated in any way. And they will carry sensory fibers via T10 to T11 that will often present in this dermatome, which is considered to be around the um umbilicus region or at the lateral flanks or the back, which is common in things like pyelonephritis or renal cell carcinoma, anything that's going to cause some sort of irritation or infection or injury to the kidneys. Now we're going to go discuss the adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands are also called the suprarenal glands. They're also bilateral organs that are located right above the kidneys themselves, hence suprarenal. Although they are in very close proximity to the kidneys, they really don't have any associated functions aside from probably the aldosterone system and the RAS axis. The adrenal glands are considered to be pyramidal shaped organs that are fatty fibrous tissues that sit above the kidneys like this. And they're important because they have endocrine functions based on their unique histology. So the adrenal glands are retroperitoneal structures just like the kidneys. And they're encapsulated organs with a capsule just like the kidneys are. They help secrete hormones and they help with normal physiologic homeostasis. And without adrenal function or acute adrenal injury, you can actually predispose the individual to sudden death. So the adrenal glands are divided into four regions based on their cortex and medulla, just like the kidneys. The adrenal glands also contain, similarly, a hilum as well for the entrance site of the arteries and the veins. So now we'll discuss the microanatomy or the, the histological aspects of the adrenal glands. So the outer cortex first contains this capsule. After the capsule, you get your zona glomerulosa, your zona fasciculata, and then your zona reticularis, or the way I remember it is G, F, R. So the G is where you get your mineral corticoids. This is where your aldosterone is produced. Your F is what produces your cortisone, your cortisol, your glucocorticoids. And then your zona reticularis is what produces all your androgens, your testosterone, your DHT. People often like using the monic, salty, sweet, sexy. Base just to remember those three locations. So after your, after your outer cortex, you got your inner medulla. And this is where you get direct innervation from the preganglionic sympathetic nerves that help with the secretion of the catecholamines, your epinephrine and your norepi, that helps with that fight or flight process. So now we'll discuss the overall adrenal arterial supply. So the adrenals are important because they receive three predominant adrenal arteries. You got your superior, your middle, your inferior. You got your inferior phrenic artery giving off your superior adrenal arteries. And as we mentioned before, this is your first branch of the abdominal aorta, and as well as the first paired branches off the abdominal aorta. Then you got your middle adrenal artery, which comes off the abdominal aorta itself. And then you have your inferior adrenal artery, which comes off of your renal arteries, as you can see. The venous drainage of the adrenal glands, it drains via the right adrenal vein into the IBC, and then the left adrenal vein drains into the left renal vein. While we're talking about the blood supply, we'll also talk about the innervation really quickly. So the innervation of the adrenal glands is very similar to what it is for the kidneys. It gets sympathetic nervous systems via the celiac plexus and splenic nerves, as well as other autonomic parasympathetic nerves from that vagus nerve from the brain. Now we'll discuss the last organ in this unit, the spleen. So the spleen is a very small organ. It's only one, it's located in the left upper quadrant and it's considered to be a very blood-filled organ. It primarily functions in blood filtration as well as sequestration of old and defective red blood cells for destruction, as well as sequestration for platelets. Helps with robust immune response. 
all the times. This is a very important organ because it helps with proper uh, destruction of encapsulated bacteria such as pneumococcal, strep pneumo, meningococcal bacteria such as Neisseria meningitidis, as well as uh, Haemophilus influenza, which is often given by the nickname Shin. So this, this, this Shin mnemonic is very important because if you, for any reason, need a splenectomy, you need to do prophylactics and antibiotics for, or vaccinations for these three bacteria. So the spleen is also located in the left upper quadrant. It's pretty much located intimately with the ribs 9 through 11. So the way that I remember it's close to 9-11 is because when I think 9-11, 9-1-1, I think of emergency. So for some reason, if you would have an injury to your ribs 9 through 11, the spleen's going to bleed out especially in any sort of abdominal trauma like a car accident, a seatbelt going across your chest. If your spleen gets ruptured for any reason, you're going to spill a lot of blood into your abdominal cavity, and it's probably going to cause some sort of hemodynamic instability. So the spleen is also connected to the kidney through a series of mesenteric reflections called the gastrosplenic ligament. The splenorenal ligament is what connects the spleen to the kidney, and also houses the splenic artery, which is a branch off the celiac trunk. As we just mentioned, the splenic artery and the celiac trunk, the splenic artery is considered to be a very torturous branch. So when you have a CT scan done of the abdominal cavity and you're scrolling through the abdominal cavity and you will have a hard time trying to follow a straight line of a blood vessel to the spleen because it won't be that way. The splenic artery travels like this. So what happens is if you're doing a cut of a CT like this, you're going to see the blood vessel come in and out of focus in and out, in and out, in and out. And that's how you know you're looking at the splenic artery. The splenic artery runs along the posterior border of the pancreas and also gives off the short gastric, the posterior gastric, and the left gastroepiploic artery as it branches with the right gastroepiploic to give blood supply to the greater curvature. So the splenic artery is considered a primary blood supply to the spleen, and in times of splenic lacerations or insignificant bleedings, you can actually temporarily compress the splenic artery to help try to control this bleeding. In certain situations when the bleeding is so bad, you can actually do a temporary embolization of the splenic artery to help stop blood flow in order to give yourself enough time to kind of oh, do an x lap open it up, find the bleed, either control it or unfortunately do a splenectomy. So what's also interesting to notice is the splenic artery, once it enters into the spleen, has many segmental branches that supply different regions of the spleen. And because of this, like we mentioned before, if there is a splenic laceration that's isolated to a certain part of the spleen, you can do a segmental resection and actually keep certain parts of the spleen intact. And then, of course, once the splenic artery precedes its blood, it's also important to talk about the venous drainage, which will then eventually drain blood into the portal venous system. And that concludes this section of Da Vinci Academy.